Hello and welcome to the Non-Breaking Space Show. Our guest for this episode is Jared Spool. Jared is a writer, researcher, speaker, educator, and an expert on the subjects of usability, software, design, and research. He is the founding principal of User Interface Engineering, a research, training, and consulting firm specializing in website and product usability, and the largest usability research organization of its kind in the world. As with our last episode, this interview was recorded in the lobby of a large echoey hall during an event apart Austin. So we apologize in advance for the audio, but of course the conversation with Jared is more than worth sticking it out for. Christopher Schmidt and Sam Kapp are your hosts for this episode, which of course you can find on the webs at nonbreakingspace.tv or on Twitter at nbsptv. We've got past episodes, more info about this episode, all there. Check it out. We'd love to have you stop by and visit and follow us on the Twitters. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Christopher and Sam and their conversation with Jared. Or what type of projects? Like first, describe what, what UIE is, I guess. And, um, so uh, UIE's uh, the, the long name is uh, User Interface Engineering. Though. We've been moving away from from referring to it as that over the years, uh, but it uh, it is uh, in its current form. It's basically a research company. It's that we study how people design products and services and try to figure out why some companies are really good at it, some companies really suck, and try and, and understand what what that difference is. So what type of projects were you working on in 1988? In 1988, when we started, uh, we basically started by doing usability testing for companies, which in 1988, was a completely foreign concept, yeah. right? So in, in that time, you 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 got a bunch of engineers together, and they they basically built what they just wanted to build. And um, sometimes it would catch on, and sometimes it wouldn't, and they wouldn't understand why. Mm-hmm. And we 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 started by creating um, a. Uh, uh, a business that, that, that would go in and, in essence, show what happens when people actually use your product. Yeah. And that changed a lot of people's uh, perceptions about what good design is and, and, and how maybe, you know, the thought, things they were building weren't quite working right. And... Uh, so we built a, for the first few years, we built a business that thrived just basically conducting usability tests. And nobody else was doing that. We were the only ones doing it anywhere. And the, um, and we could do it, we could, we, we created this portable lab capability and we could, we could do it anywhere. Um, by portable lab, like what, can you describe it? Uh, we, we would, we would videotape. And we would have a logging system so that we could timestamp everything that was going on. And uh, uh, in some cases, we would use uh, uh, sophisticated software to capture what was going on on the screen. And, uh, hardware, we would use uh, scan converters and, and stuff. So we had this, basically, it was a television studio in a suitcase. Oh, wow. And we could set it up and we could, um, and we could set it up on other people's equipment, which was really important uh, to be able to go in and, take whatever hardware the client was running or the, the end user was running and set it up and start recording off their screen. So what type of hardware are you talking about? Was, uh, like a PC or something? Or just a... Yeah, yeah. So back in the day, it was all desktop computers, right? Okay. This is pre-laptops. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, I guess in 88, there were the, the first laptops were, were just coming out. Uh, like the suitcases uh, still. The early nineties. Uh, no, no, the suitcase stuff was a little earlier. That was uh, 80, 84, 85. So no, these would be the early Toshibas and uh, uh, grids. And they looked a little bit more like typewriters, sort of. No, the, no, they were they were they 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 were clamshell laptops like we had okay. today, uh, but they would have a, a, a black and white screen, for example. Um, they would run a, a, a slow 8386 processor or something of that sort. Um, uh, they would, they would, you know, you could run Windows um, on it, though the early ones just ran DOS. Yeah. 
Wow. So, and what type of projects, like, what type of things were you testing? Like, so. Oh, well, we tested all sorts of stuff. We we did some consumer product things, um, or business products, uh, uh, backup software, and uh, we did uh, email clients and uh, word processors. We did a lot of work for Lotus, so we did we worked on one, two, three, and wow. and um, uh, uh, they had a suite called Symphony, and uh, eventually they had a whole product line um, uh, called the Lotus Suite that had uh, uh, freelance and uh, WordPro and, and a variety of, of oh, yeah, a variety of, of different uh, tools basically, but. Um, uh, which you know, Microsoft copied to make the, the Word, Excel, present uh, suite. So we we worked on a whole bunch of stuff there. We also worked on um, molecular modeling tools, all sorts of very sort of vertical market tools. So molecular modeling, we worked on some stuff for for NASA, both in aerospace and in um, uh, space station related stuff. We worked on some DoD projects. We worked on some NIH projects. Um, so all, all over the board. Yeah, we worked on a system for uh, for the FDA to figure out uh, to, to streamline um, critical reports, you know, adverse reaction reports. So uh, someone contacts a company and says, I've been taking your pills and now my hair is green. Yeah. Um, they, uh, uh, there's all this paperwork that has to be done as soon as that report comes in. Yeah. It has to be filed with the FDA within 24 hours and there's all sorts of crazy. And we did we did a lot of work just following the paperwork yeah. through all the people wow. who touched it. At the pharmaceutical company, at the, uh, at the FDA. Um, so it's more like you're trying to find what's going on and then streamline it. Yeah, to try and understand what the what the efficiencies were. We ended up creating these three D models of the buildings and actually showing how the paper moved through each floor of the building. Oh wow. And and the interesting thing of that project was the number of photocopies that were made. Oh yeah. Yeah, because everybody who would touch it would make a photocopy of it, stick it in a filing cabinet, and then give it to the next, sign whatever they were supposed to sign and give it to the next person. Right. And so within any given building, there were 12 or 13 copies of the same document. Wow. Um, and between the, the six or seven facilities that touched the document, there were probably 40 or 50 copies, wow. which would never, ever, anybody would ever look at. Yeah. As long as they have a copy. They had a copy and because they, they, need, they needed to have proof that they had touched it. And signed it, and 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 so so everybody had to have, so you know this was the sort of beginning of of, of workflow, trying to understand workflows, and and so that was this is all in the beginning. Being yeah, this was this was all eighty eight to to ninety three ninety four type stuff, and and what what started happening was that we would go work for these companies. Like we would work for a company that made uh, uh, software that was used to test circuit boards. Mm-hmm. So they had these very sophisticated circuit board testing equipment. Okay. And now these things had PCs built into them. Up until, you know, a few years before, they were basically mechanical machines. Okay. But na- now they were, uh, they had PCs and software. And these hardware companies knew nothing about making software. Right. So so we would spend time helping them do this. And they were making mistakes that we saw everybody else mistake, make. So we started putting together workshops to say, you know, these are the ways that people do things. And these ways work well. And these way, ways don't work well. And you keep doing the stuff that doesn't work well because it seems like the obvious thing to do. But... And, you know, you're copying Microsoft, but it turns out that that doesn't work well when you actually watch people use it, uh, particularly when it's not in a word processor. And and so suddenly, um, uh, you know, we had this, this sort of compendium of design patterns, uh, though nobody called it that, then, that was stuff that worked well and stuff that didn't. So uh, what happened was that uh, our... 
um, our business shifted yeah. to be less about actually going and doing the studies, though we still did a lot of them, uh, and more about here's the collective knowledge we've accrued by watching these hundreds of people actually use all these different applications and the sort of common things that keep coming up. Right. You know, if if your OK and cancel buttons in your in your dialog boxes aren't clear, people will accidentally press cancel when they mean OK, and then they'll be screwed. And and, and we, we started to, to share. Back in the day, there was this uh, very popular notion of wizards. Uh, these oh, were these yeah. step-by-step things. Oh, you're going to have a graph wizard and a, and a, uh, a circuit board editing wizard. And, and a paperclip and, wizard. Yeah, yeah. And so there were all these wizards that, that were these sequence sets of dialog boxes to walk you through to get a goal and the idea would be that each choice would sort of dictate what the next screen was and right. and it would create the thing for you. Yeah. And so we accumulated a ton of knowledge about how to make wizards that worked and more importantly all the ways you could make them that didn't work. Okay. And um, uh, pretty much disavowed everybody of the notion that these were actually a good idea of right. these on so a lot of these workshops, were they um, something, I guess this would be mid-90s, so they weren't online, they were in person, were they at um, conferences that were design related or more at a business conference where... No, we, we would host them. We, we would, host we them. would, we we started just, just, there were no conferences really. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there were some, the, the, there, there was the Kai conference, which still goes on. Um, it was in Paris this year. I think it's in Toronto next year. Uh, uh, the uh, the soundscape here is rich. Give me a second. The uh, 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 there was the. Uh, uh, the the UPA conference started in 1992. I was a keynote speaker for that, the first one, uh, Usability Professional Association conference. There was um, there were a couple of magazine run conferences. Um, there was a, some software development conferences that we I would go speak at. Um, Wait, well, let's, let's talk about the conferences because, like, uh, you speak at a lot of conferences. Yeah, probably about forty a year. Or so, right. so uh, obvious question uh, from my, my brain as someone who does conferences and some of that: How do you maintain that schedule? Because you've been doing that for like, I don't know, I'm gonna say a decade almost. But I, I have a big calendar. <laughs> <laughs> write dates in. Yeah. I am diligent about writing dates in because I have had just. Unfortunately, it has happened where I've said yes to two things happening at the same time. Yeah. So I am very careful now not to not to do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, there's this whole sort of planning sequence, and I book conference. My my conference speaking is booked. I'm now booking stuff that's happening at the end of 2014. Wow. It it it. Uh, I have dates all through 2014 booked at this point, and and I'll keep doing it. And you know, I like. Last week, I got a some dude sent me an email. And says, "I hear you're a good speaker, and I was wondering if you could come talk to my team uh, on October 9th in Dubai." I'm like October 9th, it's like two weeks from now. There's no way I'm getting to Dubai <laughs> on October 9th, uh, even if I wanted to come. Yeah. And uh, I don't know where you heard I was a good speaker. I, uh, <laughs> someone's lying. To me. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's not the case because, like, uh, when researching was like. You've been closing up at the park, which we're at the park also right now. So yes, and uh, you've been closing up at the park. <laughs> You're right. That's where we are. Yeah, we are. Right here, so. <laughs> uh, but you've been closing up at the parks uh, for as long as I can remember. Like, no, I, I've uh, been the closer for about two years. Two years. Um, they used to have Jeff V close, yeah. and, then, and then he went off to get rich. So yeah. um, <laughs> since I'm not rich, they have me <laughs> closing, and it's unlikely I will get rich. Actually, next year I won't be. Closing. I'll be uh, uh, I'll be at the end of the first day. It seems. 
You did uh, also cl- close uh, Converge Florida. I did. That I was at. Yeah, I, I, I managed to close Converge Florida. People have me as the closer because nobody cares if they miss my talk and everybody <laughs> has to go catch their flights. So, uh, and that's woefully not true. <laughs> like, that is like, because uh, you still got image hole uh, way back in the day. Yes. Sorry, first one in Orlando, I think. Actually. Yes, and I, uh, I believe I was the closer there. Yeah, you were the closer there. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know, some people stuck around, but you know, people took off. Well, it's, it's the thing I hear the most. It's like, hey, dude, I'm so sorry, I missed your talk. Like, That's okay. I was looking through the slides. It's all stuff I've heard before. <laughs> You're not missing anything. <laughs> but uh, you bring a lot of energy to the, the presentations I've seen. So it's, it's always a great way to have, to end the conference. So thank you. It's uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, there's no reason to not bring energy to a presentation. It's it's particularly at the end of the day. It's it's a it's a long day, and, and one of the things I learned is is that the, it's it's actually primal um, neurology that makes it work. It's it's. We have a, a, a system um, in our brain called the reticular system, and, it, and it, uh, it, it's based in the amygdala, uh, uh, which is not to be confused with the amygdala, which is a princess. <laughs> uh, um, and the uh, the amygdala, it's basically people refer to it as the lizard brain. Okay. It's, it's you know the same brain stem that existed back when we were crawling out of the sea, and the the system triggers when something we need to pay attention to has come into our focal range, and so it's the thing that triggers when uh, when we see a predator or when we are hungry and we see something that could be food. It turns out that we've developed it a lot, so it also triggers when. Um, we're shopping for cars, we seem to see more car ads okay. than we used to, or if we're interested in a particular model of car, we seem to see those everywhere, whereas before we hadn't seen them at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the same system that causes us to notice things that we're actively interested in. And one of the byproducts of it is that we are naturally in tune to pay attention to other people, other, other animals in our species getting excited. If you watch prairie dogs, they all stand. Uh, uh, there are these great videos of these prairie dogs just sort of standing on guard. And they're sort of out in the prairie and they're all sort of standing on guard. And some of them are falling asleep. And you see them sort of nodding off and just falling asleep. But the, uh, uh, what happens is, is that uh, one of them will spot an owl and start to get excited. And they don't, they don't have a vocabulary. They just start to show excitement. And as soon as one of them gets excited, they all get excited, right? And, and it could be a false alarm, but they just do it, right? It's the same thing that causes birds to fly out of it when they hear a sharp noise. It's, this, it's the same thing, and, and we do the same thing. And when there's someone up on stage who's really excited, yeah. our, our reticular system fires up and says, what the hell is he excited about? Right. And it's like, I better pay attention to this. Mm-hmm. And so being really... Um, Excited in a presentation actually gets people's attentions because we're programmed to pay attention to that. They may not agree with what's being said, but the fact that the person is so excited makes you go, well, this person is, is, is just there. And this is probably the, the key mistake I see a lot of new presenters make is that they think all that sort of excitement and passion will make them look foolish so they reserve it yeah. and they get up and they just sort of talk like this and they say I, I think that we need more standards in web design and it's important that we use design methods that are and, and suddenly the, the the audience is like okay well this dude is not passionate about this so I'm going to check my mail right. and so it's so like when you start a new presentation you go do you like you know you know, you know, you know the content you want to bring do you like well I mean I don't want to talk like the word about but like how do you start a new presentation then, knowing that? How do I start creating a new presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I work on presentations for months. Yeah. Um, the conference, but sometimes, you know, I'm sort of in front of an audience. It's like, hey, you're presenting. Oh, really? 
<laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, Dana and I uh, uh, showed up at uh, 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 Dave Chisnell is, is uh, my fiance and, uh, so we often travel together and she wrote the handbook of usability testing so she's also a pre- seasoned presenter and, and very good and we were we were in Salt Lake City to uh, uh, I was being given an award I won an award. It was very exciting. I still have no, to this day, I have no idea what the award is for. It's the Stevens Award for Computer Science Education. Yeah. I, I, I actually don't know why they gave it to me. But I was honored to get it, and I gave a little speech and whatever. But, you know, it was at a conference about Air Fo- about security in the armed forces. Yeah. I don't know why that was the conference they gave me the award at, but I had no interest in the rest of the topic. So, so. <laughs> I, you know, after this dude in an in a, uh, uh, Air Force Major's uniform handed me my, my little document that said I'd won the award, uh, um, and I gave my little speech, it was 9.30 in the morning, it's like, okay, I'm done. And knowing that I was going to Salt Lake City for this, uh, I uh, uh, contacted some of my friends over at the, the Church of Latter-day Saints, who do incredible design work. They're, they're, they've got a fabulous team and they do some incredible design work and, uh, and I often do this if I'm coming into a city I'll, I'll reach out to folks or sometimes folks will reach out to me and say hey you know I'm going to be in town when I get together and so I'll go meet the troops and stuff and usually what this entails is a very informal thing sometimes there's food not oftentimes there isn't even that and then we just sit, or sit around a conference table and talk about what they're doing from a design perspective yeah. And what we've been working on, and we just have a conversation like this, and it's usually very informal. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I mentioned to them that Dana would be with me. Could Dana could tag along? They said, oh, absolutely. We'd love to have Dana tag along. And so we get there, and um, uh, they say, hey, but, you know, before we meet with everybody, uh, we want to give you a little tour of our new library, which was a gorgeous facility. It's the, the, they, they have this, this, this beautiful library of comparative religions and the work they do there. And at one point we went up to the bindery shop, uh, like in the back of the, we go through these tunnels in the back of the library and we end up in this place of bindery. And we go in there and there's four dudes, one of them uh, looked, uh, they, they all looked like they were out of the movie Cocoon and one of them uh, uh, looked like, what was his name, the, the lead dude in Cocoon? Uh, um, uh, man, I can picture him. Anyway, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, and and uh, and so uh, Dana asks. They're showing us all their techniques and stuff. And Dana at one point says to the says to the to the uh, uh, Wilford Brimley. Okay. <laughs> Wilford Brimley. So this Pretty dude cool. looks just like Wilford Brimley. Talks just like Wilford Brimley. And and uh, 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 Dana says to him, says, uh, uh, "What was the what's the the most interesting book you ever worked on?" Thinks about it. Oh, the most interesting book I ever worked on. I think it was the green one. <laughs> the green one. Yeah, it had this really ornate binding, and, and it was all hand stitched, and, and it took me months to redo the binding. I had to redo every page and, and, and put it back together, and it took us months. We probably worked on it for about a year. Dave says, "Well, what what was in it?" So, you know, I work on these books. I don't actually know what's in them. I just, I just know that they're books. I mean, I'm working on the back of the books. He, he turns around and says, hey, Mark, Mark, uh, uh, that green book we worked on for a year, what was that? And Mark looks up from his desk and says, oh, that was a Gutenberg. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. So not only did he work on a Gutenberg Bible, he didn't remember that he worked on a Gutenberg Bible. He just remembered it had a cool binding. Have you but, ever seen one in person? I have seen one in person. We have two in Austin. That's right. I knew that, actually. It's uh, quite uh, amazing. And they have one at this library. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's crazy, wow. right? So, so, anyways, we're done with the tour, and we go downstairs, and, then, and we get down to where the, where the meeting's going to be. And there's this giant sign that says, Today, uh, uh, User Experience Conference. Keynotes, Jared's fool, Dana just now, right? And Dana didn't even bring her laptop, right? Yeah. She thought we were just going to hang out with the dudes, right? Yeah. I hadn't thought about giving a presentation. Yeah. It turns out they'd worked out this whole afternoon of events, but they'd forgotten to tell us. 
<laughs> and, uh, um, uh, and it was fine. Uh, uh, I just kicked into automatic pilot and gave a presentation off my lap. It turned out we could get access to Dropbox so we could pull down uh, uh, a presentation from her. From that point on, I always put my presentations in Dropbox. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, that's also like, that's the uh, nature of being a speaker is like, you just never know when you're going to be dropped into a situation as well. It's like, it's yeah, like, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I have found myself uh, uh, just sort of being in, in, in a situation where suddenly I'm expected to, to sing for my dinner. Um, but uh, uh, most of the time when, I'm, when I have a presentation, it's, it's something that I work on for quite a long time. And, and it starts as sort of nascent ideas that I try and tie together. And I'm always collecting things I could use in future talks. So I have this huge clipping file um, of examples and thoughts and quotes and, and ideas. What, how do you store these ideas? You know, over the years it's evolved, and so they're now in like five different applications because the old ideas are in one. And uh, I'm these days I'm most using Evernote. It's it's it's. I just started using Evernote. The, whatever the previous version, I tried the previous version of Evernote, and it was it was not compatible with my brain. Yeah. Uh, this version, they have done something magical to it, yeah. and now I actually can sort of figure out how I'm supposed to use it. I think within the last year they've done a lot of awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so now um, I I put uh, screenshots and examples, and I don't know how I'm going to use them. There's a there's an example in the presentation that I use at Converge. Mm -hmm. um, it's the Army Brownie present, uh, example, and I have had that example sitting around for five years. Wow! Um, just I waiting for a presentation that it made sense to use it. That I, I still need to make those brownies. I remember making a note. It's in my pocket that I, I looked up the recipe. Is it like making a, a brownie of a mug? No, no. So what it is 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 is, is <laughs> it's the military standard. It's it's mill standard C one four seven two two seven C. It's revision C oh, of okay. of how to make brownies, oatmeal cookies, and chocolate uh, chocolate frosting. And what, 27 26 pages, pages 26 is, pages. is the document <laughs> that explains exactly how to do this. And, and um, so I've always wanted to use a, you know, a 26 page recipe. Yeah, so I, I put up this slide that has the back of the Duncan Hines box that has brownies in three steps. And then mm -hmm. I put up the 26 pages of, of uh, Mill Standard 147227C. <laughs> And the ingredients were on page four for the first. No, the ingredients are on page seven, and the, the actual instructions are on page eight. And the rest of the document is 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 all about how to make sure that your measuring cups are the right measures, and, and uh, <laughs> that the supplies have not been contaminated by you know rodents, and, and if they have been, the proper procedures for disposing of the materials, uh, such that you know they don't get used in some other recipe. Because you I just put them back. <laughs> I just want to make it to see that with the 27 pages, are the brownies actually better? If I'm going through that labor of, of is something going to taste different? So I'm curious about that. No, it's actually, I, I mean, I've not made the brownies, but I know enough about making brownies that it's a pretty standard brownie. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's nothing fancy I about it. I was just it, 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 What it has is a lot of chocolate. It, 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 there's not a lot in the way of artificial ingredients. What's really cool about the brownie recipe yeah. is that it's all stuff you would have if you were making them from scratch and home because they uh, they need to be made in the middle of you know the deserts of Afghanistan, yeah. and you're not going to have a lot of stuff. That you, I mean, they. You get big things of flour and big things of eggs and big things, and you, you know you have to make it with those raw ingredients. And so it's a pretty much a, a made from scratch brownie recipe. It's not very exciting. Um, it, they they have a lot of discussion about the tolerances of the oven that you would cook it in, how hot it has to get or cold, and and, and uh, um, how much time you need for cooling it off, uh, cooling off the brownies if you're in a desert. Takes longer to cool the brownies down than, than if you're in the Arctic. <laughs> so, so it's it's um, yeah. And what's interesting about the document is that it's all about exception cases, right? Yeah. Almost all of the document has to deal with these weird 
ass exception cases. And uh, whereas the Dark and Hines box doesn't deal with exception cases. It just says, this is, you know, three steps, make these brownies, do it this way, you'll be fine. I think there's but one if, line for altitude, and that's it. That's yeah. That's that's the only thing, and, and so so there's no there's no variation. There's no well. What do you do if you have an allergy to you know nuts? There's no any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Whereas the army document goes through all those details, and and wants to make sure that 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 every exception is 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 dealt with because you need a single source to get that information, and the people who are dealing with this need to understand how that works. And and it's it's an interesting juxtaposition. But yeah, that example I've been sitting on for five years. And I have examples like that. I have stuff that I've never figured out how to use well. I have stuff I put into presentations and I take them out because I don't like the way it comes out. Yeah. So I'll put it in later, I'll take it out again. Yeah, that's one thing is like always be you know, if you're if you want to do it and keep on doing it, always be working on it, updating yeah. Because well, our industry changes so fast anyway. If we do coding it's always Changing things out, yeah. But also, just it's a leave. It's a, I use a phrase about like a, a living document, you know, but uh, it's it's yours. So you can actually like you know, take ownership of it, and, you know, right? Right. And I and I I repeatedly do the same presentation. So the presentation I did at Converge, uh, I did that on a Friday. The next Saturday, I did it in Washington D.C. Um, at uh, Mobile UX Camp. Uh, the following Monday, I did it at a presentation for the White House Innovation Fellows. Um, uh, and then I'm doing it again this coming Friday uh, at um, Web Afternoons Atlanta, and it's changed dramatically since Converge. I, I, I have I have been reworking it uh, because I, I didn't like the storyline of Converge, and and uh, now I have a storyline I like, and so it's just a more sort of minor tweaks. So it, it uh, the narrative of a talk is very important. So, so, like, the brownies were at the beginning of that talk, and now they're at the end. Just the, it's the dessert at the end. The sweet it's cake. the dessert <laughs> at the end, yes, yes, I hadn't thought of that. Yes. So, like, how, how do you go about forming a narrative? Then? It's, it's, it's very important. Thing. So, there, there are tricks to forming narratives. I mean, they're age old, right? I mean, you know, Homer's Odyssey had a great narrative to it. Um, we've been telling stories for a long time. There's, there's this build up and then uh, um, where you sort of establish what's going on and then uh, uh, then you have to have some sort of low mm-hmm. and then uh, uh, and then you have to sort of build up again with some positive activity that gets you to some sort of victory mm-hmm. right so so it's it, it's a sort of hero's journey type narrative the, the, the narrative structures there are a handful of them that you can use that, that, that work pretty well so in a presentation, it's there's really sort of understanding the problem, and then you know I'll often use uh, uh, some tropes like trying to, to show all the things that people have tried that haven't worked, yeah. and then um, uh, start to sort of break things into some uh, basic abstract notions. And start to tweak the abstract notions, and then come back and show some successes. And so, so um, put it back together. So you know, we sort of deconstruct things and then put them back together. And it's 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 not unlike Iron Man, where you know he he builds these cool things, and he finds himself you know having to to, to deal with a, a bad guy who actually overpowers him, and then uh, he has to sort of be ingenious and and take things and and overpower that guy even though the odds are against him uh, uh, so there's a, a deconstruction of, of what he's capable of and then a reconstruction in a new form and, and that's how he's victorious at the end of the thing and you know, he gets the girl and and I never get the girl in my talks I did once and she's my fiance now but, but the other times I never did it seems like a good pattern though I mean it is the, the testing process even if you are Iron Man you have to Iterate and rebuild. Yes, and yes, yeah. yeah. There's the definitively thing. an iteration process that happens. And, Even if you're a superhero. And and there are little tricks. Like one of the things that Dana taught me was uh, she does this all the time, and I and I started picking it up. And I, it's a little, it's an awkward thing, mm-hmm. but it actually is really valuable. 
I'll have someone come up to me after a presentation. They're like, dude, that was like the best presentation. I'm like, yeah? What would you like about it? You get this sort of deer in the headlights there for a moment. Like, you're not supposed to ask me that. You're just supposed to say thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, um, uh, which I often say, but, but, but uh, 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 then I say, what would you like best about it? And, and after they think about it for a second, they come back with something. Whatever comes out of their mouth that first thing, that sort of tells me what, what they retained from it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, keep, I keep changing the presentation until the things they're telling me are the things I wanted them to get out of the presentation. That's a great way to test. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, they, you know, it's like, I really love the brownie thing, okay? Well, the brownie thing's good, but that wasn't the message. Yeah. Exactly. You know? But I, at, after Converge, I had this woman come up to me and said, you know, uh, uh, those brown, the brownie thing, that's exactly what we're doing in our school when we're creating these massive documents of how you're supposed to design stuff. And it's not working for us. Like, okay, you got the message. <laughs> well, I, I do want to circle back for a second. Talk about UIE in the in the nineties. In the nineties, yeah. Uh, we're we're going to just walk through the twenty-five year history of UIE. Okay. <laughs> but like, so, like, how how big was the company when it started? In um, about one hundred and eighty pounds. Okay. <laughs> um, it was just me. Yeah, and, then, and I was lighter then. Um, I am not that light now. Um, now we're two and a half metric tons. Um, but no, for the first couple of years, it was just me. And then, and then, um, then I brought on a woman named Carolyn Snyder, who, uh, was brilliant. And, uh, uh, one of the things we started playing with in the 90s, so we started explaining how design, uh, how all these design failures right. and, and patterns that we're working on, and we got very interested in the subject of how do you um, how do you prevent these things from happening? Right? It's one thing to build them and then realize through usability testing that you screwed up. But uh, usability testing is a, a final inspection. Well, the way it was being used then was a, a final inspection yeah. moment. And anybody who knows anything about quality control knows that final inspection is the least efficient way to find defects in a product. Yeah. So you get you build this whole thing, and then you put it in front of users, and you find out the users hate it. Yeah. You've just spent all this energy building it. Now you go back, you build something again, you put it in front of users, you find out it's different, but they still hate it. You're not getting anywhere very fast. You're not, you know. So, so, but the problem was that usability testing was a really expensive process. Back then. Um, it was very foreign. It took a lot of time, weeks, um, and you needed something to test. Uh, so, back in the '90s, in the early '90s, we started experimenting with uh, paper prototypes, and we were doing really sophisticated stuff. So that. Um, circuit board testing system, we showed that team how to build the entire interface out of paper. And this was completely foreign to them. They did not understand why you would do that when you had software you could write. But we we would, and what we would do to create the paper prototype was that we would get the whole team together in a room. So what we would do is we would commit we would get the team to commit to to stopping whatever they were working on and coming together for a week. And on the first day of the week, uh, we would actually call the project six days because there was one day that we would meet before the week started where we'd basically introduce the idea, but we'd also figure out who the participants in the usability test were going to be. And then we'd start the recruitment process, and then three weeks later, we would have this one-week event. And And the Monday morning, we would get there. And we would do a little bit of introduction, but then we'd break out the scissors and the paper and the markers. Yeah. And we'd take the design of however it stood at that point, which may have been just in the minds of a couple of people, and we would divide it into pieces. And you, know, you would work on the menus, and you would work on the dialog box for the, for the test system, and I would work on the print subsystem. And, and we would, you know, the report printer. And... 
Um, uh, we would each just take paper and pencil and sketch out stuff and, and, and you would create little working pieces of everything. So it wasn't just a sketch. It was a working version. So if something were to pop up on the screen, we'd have a little piece of paper with whatever that was. If there was a pull down, we'd have a piece of paper with all the options in the pull down. And we would, we would create these things. And then after a couple hours, we'd actually take some tasks that we had created and on the first visit and uh, walk through um, using the prototype to do those things. Uh-huh. And of course, it never worked. Yeah. Right? We were, oh, wait, we're, how would you get from here to there? You know, there's no button. My favorite was we would always leave off the uh, OK button in the dialog boxes. Everybody always lived off the OK button. So, you know, say, well, I click on this, and then the person playing the computer would pull the, the, OK, the dialog box away. I go, wait, 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 wait. How, is it just going to, will you click and then it pulls it away? And, well, no, you have to confirm. I said, okay, well, where's the confirm button? Uh, okay, I need to draw it in. <laughs> okay, 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 done. Okay. Do you need a cancel button? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Right, so, so we, would, we, would, we would slowly build this thing up, and we'd just keep testing it. And that would be the first two days of the project. And on the third day, um, after we'd run through it a dozen times amongst ourselves, uh, we'd have our first participant from our usability test. And... Uh, they'd come in in the morning, and we would ask them to do the task. And, of course, the things that always worked for us, they couldn't do. Yeah. And then they would go away, and then we would change the paper prototype. So we'd have an hour allocated to redo the paper prototype based on what we just learned. And then we'd have another participant come in, and we'd test it again. And and we would do that. So in the course of, of a week... Uh, 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 so we do that Wednesday, Thursday, a little bit of Friday. We'd have more participants. So we probably get somewhere between eight and twelve participants, in, depending on the subject matter we were working on. And then we'd spend Friday afternoon documenting what we'd done and putting together a presentation for the stakeholders, for the execs who were participating. And it was like life changing for these teams. Oh yeah, because in one week we had taken a rough idea. And instead of sitting down and writing these massive specification documents, we actually had a working prototype that didn't work, and then it did work as we went through all these users. Yeah. And each time we got something working, we'd run into new problems from some piece we'd never gotten to before because it hadn't been working, and we'd fix that. And, and so at the end of the day, they were like, oh my gosh, we found out that our users do it this way and this way, and they don't understand when we say this, but when we say it this other way, it works much better, and... and they would tell us all these things about, about the design. And the teams did all the work, right? Uh, uh, Carolyn and me and the other people at, the, at UIA, we were just facilitators for this process. Right. And so we could come in to subject matters we do nothing about right. and, and, and get to do this. And, and this completely changed the way a lot of these organizations were building stuff. Were you uh, documenting this with um, just a camera? Photocopy. Photocopy. Cameras were too expensive because you had to take the film and process it. Mm-hmm. Right? This is before digital. Mm-hmm. So we would take all these little pieces of paper and we'd put them on the photocopier, uh, leaving white space around the pieces of paper. Mm-hmm. And then we would take the first copy and we would hand write annotations as to why this button was the way it was, why this version didn't work. We'd take the old versions and we would put it down and say, this doesn't work because of this, this, and this. Right, and we would create these, and then we would make multiple copies of that second generation document, and and that's how you did it back in the day. There was no digital nothing. Now, um, in uh, I'm teaching a mobile app design class, and um, took it over from somebody else who was teaching it before me, and he would have his students do paper prototypes, and I'm having mine do the exact same thing, and they have their little pullouts and post-it notes that move around, but they have to bring it in and have either myself or another student sit down and say, okay, I'm clicking on this, what screen does it go to? And then there's a student standing above on the table recording it with their iPhone. And then oh, yeah, so, so, the, so we started doing, when video cameras came cheap, we started mm-hmm. making walkthrough videos, which was usually the lead developer saying, okay, when you click on this, it brings it to this screen, and when it clicks on this, most boring videos ever, <laughs> except everybody watched them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because it was way better than the document that that same dude was going to write to right. explain yeah. what should be implemented. Right? So you can watch this eight-minute video of him talking through how each of these dialogue boxes work, 
And uh, um, and you could see him, you know, we had all these tricks for, for faking data and all this stuff. And we could fake, we could simulate scrolling, and we could simulate. We did video conferencing systems this way. The first PC-based video conferencing system was all paper prototypes. And the way we did the image was we took Polaroids. We went, we went and took Polaroids of people in the accounting department um, with, like, their faces and different expressions. And then when the participants would come into the study, we would put down a Polaroid that represented, we would have them have a conversation. Somebody in the room would do the voice of that person, and they would have this, they would, they would have this scenario that they were communicating, and someone else would be putting down the right picture to show that the person was frustrated with the answer, or that he was happy, or, you know, and... and uh, um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's awesome. That's pretty cool. Uh, just want to switch topics a little bit, just make sure we get in before we run out of time. But uh, uh, you're so we worked up to the nineties. Yeah, worked up to the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just skip the aughts. <laughs> and, to the present. Uh, well, yeah, um, it's my one question: is like, how how big is UIU right now? Uh, we, well, we're two companies now. Um, uh, when is this coming out? Um, probably within a month ago. Okay. So the two tech is one of the companies is in stealth mode. Okay. So, uh, uh, but you can you can learn something about what we're doing at the Unicorn Institute. So that's the company with me and Leslie Jensen. Um, uh, that's a spinoff of, of UIE. Uh, the other company is, is UIE, and, and so uh, UIE is uh, we're a little bit more than a dozen people, and. Uh, 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 the Unicorn Institute organization is, is uh, there's three of them and me. So yeah, so that's kind of what I want to talk about is like the you know, like unicorn, actually. Because uh, Sam is actually a teacher, so I should probably take, take this one. I've had many chats with Leslie about the education system and, and school and how you teach a topic that changes so much and dealing with red tape and all the sort of fun stuff that, that comes up along the way. So, um, what were some of the things that inspired you to start the school or have that conversation with Leslie to then move in this direction? What were the problems that needed to be addressed? Um, so, uh, so I, I came at it from a very different uh, vector than Leslie did. Uh, I was dealing with all my corporate clients. And seeing them struggling, seeing design growing in importance in their organizations, and seeing them struggling harder and harder and harder to hire designers, and that the designers coming out of school were deficient in their training and professionalism, um, and that uh, all the really good designers in the workplace were sort of getting entrenched where they were. The companies were realizing these guys were valuable and were treating them really well. So they weren't ready to jump. So so my clients were struggling with trying to hire. I was um, I was was uh, talking to uh, uh, Molly Holschwein actually. We had dinner with Molly Holschwein uh, uh, complaining about how you know the, we, the design schools that are out there are producing too few students, and the ones they're producing are just not the right people to go work in most of these jobs. And uh, she said, you should start a school, and I thought that was the stupidest idea ever. <laughs> and so um, uh, and she said, no, no, you really, really should do this. And so that, that sort of lingered in the back of my head, and I started having conversations with other people. And they kept saying similar things, and, and so I'm uh, having this conversation with Dan Rubin, designer now in the UK, and, and he uh, uh, and he says, "Have you talked to Leslie? I've known Leslie for years, and I and I've worked with her on some web education initiatives, but uh, but I hadn't talked to her about this." I, hadn't connected in my head. He says, you need to talk to Leslie. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out that, that um, uh, like the next day, 
Leslie tweeted uh, that um, I just happened to be looking at Twitter at this moment. She tweeted, uh, uh, I've decided to, to leave University of Tennessee and I don't know what the next chapter of my life will be, but I'm sure it'll be very exciting. And, uh, and so I just direct messaged her. I said, uh, we should talk. <laughs> and so we had a phone call within 24 hours. And I said, I'm thinking of starting a school. Would you like to be involved? And she says, I'm thinking of starting a school. It turned out she had had all these thoughts about how you would create a design school. And so we started comparing notes on how we would create a design school. And they were like 100% in sync. Wow. We, we, we just, we had independently sort of come to this idea. Mm-hmm. So the Unicorn Institute has basically been about um, uh, figuring out what a school would be like. And so that's... that's um, so you brought up professionalism. So there's going to be a fair amount of the hard skills, soft skills... Yeah, so so it was really interesting. So we, the, being a researcher at heart, mm-hmm. the first thing I wanted to do was research. And I thought, well, okay. So students are one customer of a school. Yeah. But the customer I was actually most interested in was the hiring companies, mm-hmm. right? Because the students, it's only valuable to the students if they can get a job out of this. So this, is, this is a vocational school. It's not mm-hmm. about just becoming a better, smarter person. It's not about going off and being a professor mm-hmm. and teaching more people, uh, which there are great schools that teach those things. Uh, this is a vocational school. This is, I want to learn how to do design so I can get a job to do design because I think I can do it really well and I want people to pay me to do it. Right. Right? So who's going to hire these kids? I call them kids, but they're probably going to be in their 30s and 40s. Who's going to hire these people? And um, uh, what uh, what we did was we started going to talk to companies. So we went to companies like Bloomberg and J.P. Morgan Chase and the New York Times and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and um, uh, who else did we talk to? Uh, uh, Discover Financial, Sears Holdings, and GE and Disney started talking to all these different organizations about, about designers. What did, how do you guys hire designers? How do you guys use the, your design teams? What, what, what is it like to be a designer in your place? Mm-hmm. Do you have enough designers? Are you looking to get more designers? Practically everybody was uniformly thinking that they needed more designers, that design was growing in their organization and was getting bigger. And they were um, uh, looking at uh, making sure that uh, design was the, the designs were getting better as time went on, and so we started talking about well, okay, have you have you talked talk to us about the people you're trying to hire? Well, we get it's very hard for us to hire people who have the right experience. There's a lot of people who have the wrong experience, and they come into the organization and they're frustrated because they. They have to learn all this stuff, and we have to teach them all this stuff. Right. And then there are all these students who come in, and they're right out of school, but they they aren't learning um, how to uh, how to work in a workplace. Mm-hmm. You know, the problem with traditional schools is that you go to class for two hours, you know, hour and a half, two hours, and then you go work on some work, and maybe you go to another class. Maybe you have two classes on the same days. On Fridays, you don't have classes at all. Right, and that's not how work works. Right, work you go in at eight thirty in the morning and you leave maybe at five thirty in the afternoon if it's a structured place. Some places you don't leave till much later. And uh, the the people they were seeing coming out of school did not how know how to function in that type of environment. They didn't know how to be on time. They didn't know how to how to how to stay a long day. Uh, they didn't know how to sit in a meeting and and without looking like it was killing them to be sitting there. Um, they didn't understand how to, how to communicate through email in a way that, that was there. And, and, but there were more important things, like one, uh, one of the themes that emerged was uh, hiring managers were very frustrated that um, 
that these people would get too attached to their designs. That uh, and what they the phrase that kept coming up was was we want people who are passionate about design but dispassionate about their own design. Mm-hmm. And so we, Leslie and I started to think about, well, how do you create a curriculum that teaches people to love design but not fall in love with their own design? And the thing is, in school, you, you work on a design, and then you hand it in and you get a grade. And if you got a good grade, it was because the professor saw what you saw. If you got a bad grade, it was because the professor was not paying attention, right? But there was there was no there was there, there was no sort of understanding as to why that thing wasn't going to work. And the the other thing is that a lot of a lot of projects in schools, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them are are within a given semester within a class. So you're expected to spend ten to twenty, maybe thirty hours on. You have four or five other classes you're taking at the same time, all of which have projects. So there, you, you now you have uh, uh, in a given semester you're expected to spend work on five projects simultaneously. So at best you do a surface level job, and then you turn the you turn the design in. But there's no discussion as to how that design would ever get implemented. And in many of these cases, because it's harder to grade one that has constraints, these things have no constraints. They're greenfield projects where it's like. Go off and do a project. Don't worry about constraints. Imagine any technology. Imagine anything, and go off and do this stuff. Right? And you know, imagine any database underneath it. Imagine you know any you know real world attributes. They're not going to hold you back. And and so you get a lot of projects like that. And that's what a lot of what stu- some students work on are all these greenfield projects. And that's not how the real world works. In the real world, you you have to work in this very narrow window. So. So the, the, the school that we're imagining is a school where you work on real-world projects, where you actually take them through the development cycle. So there will be developers you will work with to actually get your design built. And you will have to compromise on the design as you run into the constraints of you know the laws of physics and the realities of databases and the fact that some things are very difficult to build right now. Uh, uh, and sometimes you can't even get all the names and phone numbers to show up in the same display because they're stored in two separate tables and the time it would take to move the data and join it and filter it uh, is too long to be responsive. So you can't even have that, right? How do you work around that? And so, um, uh, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples of constraints is is, uh, telling people they've entered the wrong password on their automatic teller machine. Right, so you enter your password and you think you've entered it right, and it then starts asking you questions like, "What do you want to do? You want to withdraw money? Oh, you're going to withdraw three hundred dollars, right?" And then, and then you say, "Yes, I, I want to withdraw. Do you want to receive? Yes, I'd like to receive." And then you press the button for it to go kachunk kachunk kachunk. It doesn't go kachunk 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 because it just told you that your password's no good. And why is your password no good? Because that was the first moment that the ATM talked to the server to do an authentication check. It's too expensive for them to talk to the server before that. So uh, so they don't. So they just pretend your password worked until it doesn't. And most passwords work 98% of the time, so it's a perfectly good use case. But that's the type of constraint you have to work with it. What if you can only go to the server once? How do you do balances and authentication and a password check, right? And, and, you know, and, and a withdrawal. Right? How do you do all those things in the same transaction if you can only go to the server once or twice? Right. So, so those are the types of real world constraints that never ever get discussed in class. A lot of times, uh, being in the more traditional school system, it's the kind of throw it over the cubicle wall and hand it over to the developer, and they'll take care of the rest. And it's it's always been very segregated. And yes. trying to break that in in a four year program or in a university setting is really yeah, it's tough to do. Well, it's, I got to tell you, it's going to be tough to do in our vocational school. Yeah. I mean, we we had some ideas as to how to do it, and I think we're going to pull it off. Mm-hmm. But the the we're learning all sorts of stuff about how to make this work, and no one's ever done this before, so it's it's really crazy. But the way we imagine the program, it'll be seventy five percent project work, mm-hmm. and so you know you'll work a forty hour work week. Um, classes will be every three weeks there'll be a class and, and the first two days of those class will be an industry 
expert coming and giving a workshop, mm -hmm. and then the remaining two and a half weeks will be projects the students will work on that will be assigned projects that will have real world constraints that will be working, you know, three to five months to get to get done. And so, what's interesting is you have lots of little classes that occupy a bigger project. So when you finally take the class on typography, the question will be, okay, how do we rethink the project so that we now take what we've learned about typography and plug it in to this project that we're working on that, by the way, is a real project for a real organization uh, to be built. And there's a team of developers that are either working alongside you already or will be working alongside, whether it's an agile or waterfall model, which will teach both. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be working and, and having to produce all the deliverables and do paired design work and development work and, and all of that stuff so that so that so that you understand how design is done. And the goal is that, that students who would graduate from this school would have built five to eight of these projects and they'd be all very different from each other and could tell stories about themselves and how the projects worked and where they didn't work and how the constraints got in their way and how they worked around those constraints and they would they would have that conversation. And that turns out that once we started explaining that that's what we were thinking to the hiring companies, they went nuts. They're like, when can we have your students? Wow. Yeah. Is there, um, I was talking about uh, this with Chris earlier, the, the labels that are out there. There's UX, UI designer. There's the ad agency designer. There's all these little compartments that designers are falling under. Is there a title that? We're calling to? user experience designer. Okay. So uh, uh, we're using that very broadly. It's, mm -hmm. It includes visual design and information architecture and interaction design and copy, okay. um, uh, because copy is such a critical important piece of this, um, and, and a variety of other skills. And the, um, the UX designer um, designs the whole experience. We're focusing on digital online okay. uh, stuff, but that includes mobile, includes kiosks, includes mm -hmm. internal systems and uh, uh, customer-facing stuff. Uh, but because it's experience design, it means you have to think about how is stuff getting to the, to the online world? Where does it go after the online world? Are there gaps? You know, if, if, if I'm a Netflix customer and I sign up for the service and then I put, start watching videos and I you know, come back to it a few months later, what are all, what's the experience that happens in between all that stuff? Right? So... so uh, so those are the types of things we're, we're, we're giving straight consideration to. It's really awesome stuff. Well, I think we came to our summit point, but uh, I'll say thank you for sharing time with us. Well, thank you for having me. And, you know, to the four people who found this interesting, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> that just matches how many people listen to it. Yeah, it's matching you And how can people find you in UIE on the internet? UIE.com is, is, is the place to find me, and uh, uh, UnicornInstitute.com is where you'll find the, the stuff about that we're doing in the design school-related things. And uh, um, uh, if you just Google Jared yeah. and click I'm Feeling Lucky, yeah. you'll either get Jared Leto or the guy from somewhere. All right. Good tips to know. <laughs> cool. I'll add that to the show now. <laughs> and what's your what's your Twitter, Twitter handle? Oh, JM School. James where where are you? You know, I tweet about design and, and airlines and, and yeah, <laughs> mostly the amazing customer service that United is always stri <laughs> striving to deliver. They they are currently having a, a promotion. This is my favorite new thing. They are currently right now having a promotion called Thirty Days of Friendly because yeah. they just relaunched their Friendly Skies thing. And to, Thirty days of friendly, which which means that there's three hundred and thirty five <laughs> days of unfriendly. I, those are the days that I tend to fly. It seems <laughs> I haven't hit any of the thirty days of friendly yet. Yeah. One day. <laughs> but, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.